Not every difference of opinion should result in a disunity. And we see this principle in effect in the lifetime of the Prophet Wasallam, and then the era of the Sahaba and Tabi'un in a famous incident reported in Bukhari and Muslim. Our Prophet Wasallam, after the battle of Ahzab, the Prophet Wasallam, said to the companions that all of you wear your armor and go to the treacherous tribe of the Banu Quraidah. The command was given before the Salat al-Dhuhr. And the Prophet Wasallam said, do not pray Asr except at the tribe of Banu Quraidah. Don't do Asr in Medina. Walk or take your camel, take your horses, go to the tribe of Banu Quraidah. The Prophet left before dawn. By the time all of the Sahaba gathered in the masjid, it was already the time of Asr. But they're not allowed to pray Asr. So they said, Khalas, we'll continue walking to Banu Quraidah. So they're walking, walking, walking to Banu Quraidah. Guess what? Maghrib is gonna set. They haven't prayed Asr. The Prophet is waiting for them because he said to them, I'm expecting you there at Maghrib. They weren't able to get there. Now, the command, the hadith is there. The question is not, what does the hadith say? How do you interpret it? So the Sahaba themselves began to differ. One group said, well, you know, obviously what he meant was to hurry up. We weren't able to hurry up. So now that Asr is going to go, we can't just see the sun set and not pray Asr. That's like Qadha. Let's pray Asr and then we'll explain to the Prophet that, hey, we were late in leaving. The other group said, no, no, no. He clearly said, don't pray Asr until you get to Banu Quraidah. And so, even if the sun sets and even if it is Maghrib time, you know what? We're not going to pray Asr because that's what the Hadith says. The Prophet is not amongst them. They're differing. They're debating. There was no animosity. Nobody called the other a kafir, murtadi, dal, mudil. No fatwas, no PDFs, no YouTube video refutations. No, the Sahaba had broader mentality than many of our youngsters do. So listen, one group prayed, another group didn't pray. There was an actual ikhtilaf. And then they both proceeded until they reached and they explained to the Prophet wasallam. And guess what? The Prophet did not get irritated at either of them. Because the both of them thought that they're following the Sharia. And in the era of the Sahaba, we have a number of differences of opinion. And the Sahaba well understood that, you know what? This ikhtilaf is not a big deal. And they were still united in fiqh. And the point I want to stress, if they disagreed about some issues, even in aqidah, in theology, it is setting the cornerstone that, you know what? Even some differences in theology may be overlooked. The Sahaba disagreed amongst themselves. Ibn Abbas, Aisha, did the Prophet see Allah in Israel Mi'raj or not? One group said he saw Allah. And the other group said, no, he saw him with the qalb, not with the eyes. Another controversy in the time of the Sahaba is that if you go to the grave of the qabr of the dead person, can the dead person hear you or not? You say salam to your deceased relative, your mother, your father is buried. You go to their grave and you say salam to them. Does the dead person know that you are saying salam or not? This is a controversy that exists from the time of the Sahaba. Some Sahaba said, yes, he does. He is aware. He can hear you. And the other group said, no, he is not. This shows us that it is not possible to have uniformity and it has never existed in the history of Islam. So when it comes to differences of opinion, let's start with a chart, a spectrum. Category one, these differences should be completely celebrated and respected. An example are the mainstream madahib of fiqh. Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali. And in the past there were Zahiri, Awza'i. These are mainstream madahib. These should all be respected. And there is a statement attributed to the Sahaba. Some say it is a hadith. اختلاف أمتي رحمة. The ikhtilaf of the ummah of the Prophet is a type of mercy that Allah has given the people. The second category, differences that, but not necessarily respect them, but we acknowledge they have a level of legitimacy to them, even if we don't respect them. And examples of this can be what are called fringe opinions in the classical past of the ummah. An example for this is the position that some of the scholars of Sunni Islam advocated that Jahannam will eventually cease to exist and only Jannah will remain. And the people of Jahannam will be extinguished. Famous ulama have written treatises about it. Now this is not a mainstream opinion at all. The third category, opinions we do not respect, but we must tolerate. And this is the example of opinions that are incorrect. And we might even refute them verbally, but we have to be civil. And the classic example for this is non-Sunni movements. Any movement that astaghfirullah has opinions about the Sahaba that are wrong. That's very problematic. I don't respect that at all. Yes, if somebody asks me, I will say, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum are the greatest Sahaba of any prophet. And anybody who disrespects them, my heart has zero respect. I will say this, but must I constantly foment hatred? Must I constantly keep on riling up the crowd and make them angry and hate against a group that they barely interact with. What's the faida of that? Not every ikhtilaf should lead to a khilaf. The Ahl Hadith, for example, they say, it is established that the Prophet put his hand on his chest. If you reject the placing of the hands on the chest, this implies you are rejecting the command of 
the Prophet ﷺ, rejecting the command of the Prophet ﷺ is kufr. Hence, placing your hands on your stomach is kufr. What you've derived from the opinion is not the opinion, that's your derivation. And the person who holds it doesn't agree with your derivation. Hence, when you make a verdict on your derivation, that is not a verdict on the opinion. That is a verdict on your own derivation of the opinion. In other words, the Deobandi will say to you, I don't agree that the Prophet ﷺ prayed with his hands over here. And I have this evidence, this evidence, this evidence, evidence that he prayed over there. So from my perspective, I'm not rejecting the Prophet ﷺ at all. You're the one assuming this of me. Each of these groups then reads in heresies in the other group's opinion. Next time you hear a sheikh criticize another movement and say, they say this, this means that, cut off this means that. Because the derivation is something the person has derived and not that the other group holds. Very basic premise of theology. On the day of judgment, ignorance is an excuse within mainstream Islam. If somebody genuinely did not know, Allah will forgive them. If you rejected Allah, there is no excuse. You knowing who Allah was. If you rejected the Prophet ﷺ, that's not excuse there. But if you thought you're following the Prophet ﷺ incorrectly, it is very possible you will be excused. Even if you make a blunder of the biggest proportion. Simple example, hadith is in Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said that on the day of judgment, a man will be brought and this man when he was about to die he told his children that burn my body and disperse my ashes I don't want Allah to resurrect me I don't want Allah to bring me back together because I'm a sinner and if Allah resurrects me he's gonna punish me so I want to get out of the day of judgment so his sons burnt the body distributed the ashes in the wind Allah said Kun fayakun. the body comes up Allah says what did you do why would you do this and the man said Ya Rab I was scared of you so Allah says because of your fear for me I have forgiven you he thought he could out trick Allah correct but did he do so out of arrogance or out of fear, fear of Allah. Allah looked at the spirit above the letter of the law. Look at the world around you and ask yourself, is this the time and the place I need to be bickering about issues that are of no tangible concern? When your house is on fire and you're going to be arguing over the color of the furniture. During the time of Ali radiallahu an, a splinter group formed with a different fiqh and a different aqidah and a different methodology. Everything was different. Ali radiallahu an attempted to debate with them. He sent Ibn Abbas to them. He went back and forth. Some of them came back. Over 2,000 of them remained. And they said they don't even want to live amongst the Muslim women in Kufa. They want to live in a city outside of Kufa because they felt that the rest of the Muslims were all misguided. Ali radiallahu an being the Khalifa. And this is important because Ali radiallahu an is respected by Sunnis and Shia. What was his policy? As the Khalifa. He could have said, I'm going to force you to follow my version of Islam. Under Khulafa al-Rashidun rule, he said to them, I have no right to force you to follow my interpretation. So as long as you don't physically harm other people, you are free to do as you please. It was only when the Khawarij began highway robbery and began threatening and killing, then Ali radiallahu had fought them. We live and let live for any strand of Islam, except when they become violent then we need to get involved as a community. Brutal, raw honesty. Sunni, Salafi, Deobandi, Barelvi, Hizb, Ikhwan, whatever you want to call. It. We are all one when it comes to alcohol is haram, zina is haram, LGBT is unethical. We are all one when it comes to akhlaq and morality. We are all one when it comes to praying five times a day and worshiping Allah and reading Quran and fasting Ramadan. 